You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. This is another edition of our special series called The Path to Libertarianism. And our goal with these is basically to talk to people that you may have heard of, uh, prominent libertarians, talk about their development as libertarians so you can hear your story and theirs. And we, we try to talk to a broad spectrum of people. Somebody that we're talking to today is... Uh, I'm very excited to be talking today to Joe Bissett. I'm very excited. <laughs> that won't come out of the video, but uh, that'll come out of the audio. Uh, I'm very excited today to be talking to Joe Bishop Henchman, who is a chair for the National Libertarian Committees. Uh, well, you're running for chair. And Joe, for I, I don't know why. T please tell me why. Why would you do this to yourself? Well, uh, there's a lot of work we've got to do. Uh, I want to see us actually be a viable third party electing people. Uh, I'm pretty impatient seeing all of the bad public policy being made all over the country and wish we had more libertarians at the legislative negotiating table. So that's what I want to see happen. Well, great. Well, we're, we're glad you're running. And many of the people here at We Are Libertarians are big fans, including myself, and Thank wish you. you all the best. If you want to find out more about his run, you can go to winwithjoe.org. But let's start with your development, and we'll talk a little bit more about your race for chair and all that towards the end. Sure. Uh, we don't want to get the cart before the horse, but let's talk about little Joe Bishop Henchman. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Where, What was your family like? Where, where, did you come from a political family? What, what po political persuasions were you kind of uh, stewing in as a kid, and when did you find an interest in this? Start, start with your origin story, I guess. Sure. Well, I'm... Born and raised in San Diego County, California, and miss the weather and the beach every single day since I moved to Washington, D.C. My aunt um, and uncle are from there, and it's beautiful there. Oh, where in San Diego? Uh, Poway. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I grew up in Carlsbad, Oceanside Vista, uh, okay. uh, kind of on the other, uh, other side of uh, the hills. Um, and uh, family wasn't very political. Uh, I changed that, actually. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I guess my real first memory of a political instinct was um, when I was really young, uh, the neighbors across the street had to move and they didn't want to move, but they had to move. And so it's this elderly African-American couple, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson. They, um, you know, just wonderful. They always had the best Halloween candy. They always were everybody's babysitters when anybody needed one. Um, and then, and then they had to leave their house and move. And what was happening was uh, they were putting a new highway through nearby and they needed the land for an on-ramp uh, to kind of grade down into the on-ramp. And so they took their house and told them they had to move. And, you know, I didn't really understand why they had to move. Um, and, you know, we, we had to go through them saying their sad goodbyes and moving and, and it, you know, it left the neighborhood worse for it. In the end, they ended up rerouting the highway. So they never actually did anything with the house that they took. So it's I, I just looked on Google Earth. It's still an empty lot to this day. <laughs> um, and it, I guess at that young age, I first started realizing maybe the people in power don't really know what they're doing. Um, so kind of a proto libertarian instinct, I think. And yeah. at what age were you? I don't even remember. It was, I was, un, I was less than 10. Um, yeah. but, um, the, we were at the San Diego County fair in 92. So I would have been 11 at that point. And libertarian party had a booth at, at the fair, picked up some literature, uh, and, you know, it kind of made sense to me and, uh, even even that young. And then in 96, uh, Harry Brown and Joe Jorgensen were the national ticket, and I organized a little pamphlet handing out chapter of Youth for Brown Jorgensen in 96. Were you um, the one? Were you like... <laughs> we, had two, we had two others, so uh, uh, maybe the largest chapter in the country. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, printed up our own little uh, own little pamphlets and handed them out, and uh, and then, uh, you know, we were off and, off and running. Um, the, in, in, when I was a teenager, uh, we, uh, San Diego passed a curfew law. 
in order to tell teenagers they had to stay inside after dark um, based on this misguided, you know, teenagers cause youth, cause, cause crimes and all that. Um, so we organized a bunch of protests against it. Uh, an organization called Libertarian Rock. Um, so it was kind of a combination of a whole bunch of different groups. But, uh, you know, we did the messaging and everything. And MTV actually came out and, and filmed us protesting against the curfew. Um, so that was my first media appearance. Uh, I would have been 16 at the time. Do you remember um, the show? Because I bet you that my high school was featured on the same show you were featured on. It's the show was called uh, Fight for the Right. Um, oh. it, and uh, somebody found an archival copy, but then now it's been misplaced again. And I've been trying Convenient to find it. Since you're running for office. That's well, all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Joe. Yeah, yeah. But we haven't been able to find it. But, you know, I, I, it happened. And, um, uh, you know, we actually were able to get a First Amendment carve out put into the law. So oh. to this day in San Diego, it's it's still against the law if you're under a certain age to be out after 10 p.m. But if you wear a sticker that says repeal the curfew while you're out, you're exercising your First Amendment rights. You come under that exception. You're able to be out uh, after dark. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really cool. So let's go back to Harry Brown uh, yeah. because he kind of a forgotten he, he's been resurrected a little bit in the last uh, month or so just because of jacob hornberger and his past with brown and sure. and hornberger's run and and treatment of amash but harry brown in i've been around the movement for about 15 years and there's certain names that sort of everybody it starts with those people it starts with harry mm -hmm. brown for the older people, the older Gen X or boomers, and then it goes to Ron Paul. Now it's Gary Johnson. Soon it'll be, you know, presumably uh, Justin Amash or a uh, Thomas mm -hmm. Massey. Um, but Harry Brown's memory is kind of fading a little bit. He passed away in the early 2000s. Can you talk a little bit about Harry Brown? What attracted you to him? I know you were younger, but like, what are yeah. some of your memories of Mr. Brown? Well, I mean, I don't want to overstate it. I think I only met him twice in my life. Once when he kind of his campaign swung through San Diego in 1996. And then once um, in the Bay Area when I was in college, uh, we the Cal Libertarians, which I was either vice president or president of at the time, we all went over to go to his fundraiser in 2000. So those are the only times I ever met him. But um, his book, he wrote a lot of books, but his book, Why Government Doesn't Work, which was his 96 campaign book, it's on my shelf. Oh yeah, um, it it really just spoke to me, and you know everybody, every libertarian's got some favorite books, and they're all kind of different ones. Um, you know, objectivists really like the kind of uh, philosophical or fictional uh, scope of Ayn Rand, and uh, obviously a lot of people like Mises and Rothbard. Um, I, I guess I'm a charts and graphs, and you know timelines and history kind of guy and that's really kind of how why government doesn't work is set up it's it's kind of a classic public policy brief of outlining the problem explaining why the problem is the problem and then laying out solutions and he does that for i think it's 10 or 12 different issues and those are the chapters of the book and uh you know i the, it was persuasive enough for me that there were a few areas at the time when I first read it where I wasn't fully on board and it completely turned me around on some of those issues. And I mean, to this day, I still hand out to, to kind of new libertarians. I still hand out the book um, because that that's it, it's what kind of pulled me in. So um, when like Governor Lincoln Chafee uh, joined the party last summer and uh, came to Washington, D.C., I gave him a copy of, of Why Government Doesn't Work by Harry Brown. And I said, "This I really like this. I hope you really like it, too. Um, and, uh, you know, he just had a way to synthesize everything. And, you know, I read something about before he died, he was working on a book about war. Mm. And uh, the, you know, what Eisenhower called the uh, the military industrial complex. And and it's kind of pushed to uh, to keep us engaged everywhere. And. Um, according to his widow, um, Harry Brown had read, you know, hundreds of books, made notes all over the place, was trying to work with the structure of it. Um, so, I mean, he just didn't like sit down at a computer and, and, and dash stuff off. I mean, everything he wrote was thoroughly sourced, thoroughly referenced, absolutely factual. And, uh, you know, that just really spoke to me.
Yeah, he wrote several different types of books. One's about one about investing. Mm -hmm. um, there's one that I have relied on a lot, along with Jeffrey Myron's book and Ron Paul's book, along the same vein. Uh, Liberty A to Z, I think, is what Harry Brown's book is called. Ron Paul's was Liberty Defined. There are some of these, and, and the thrust of these books are basically here's it's in a little mini explainer on that particular issue. Mm -hmm. you know, so you flip to the social security section and then he's got a bunch of talking points and Liberty A to Z has been really helpful for me over the last decade. And what's funny about Harry Brown's why government doesn't work. Cause I went back and I looked at it about a year ago, just kind of looking through it. It really, you don't think about, I, I'm 36. I don't know if you want to share your age, 39, 39. So we're about the same age, but you know, being politically interested in the 90s and being awake and aware of kind of what was going on, you go back through Harry Brown's book or the Clinton 92 campaign book and you just see how different politics was yeah. and how those books, those campaign books, those debates, everything was so much more policy focused, lots of conversations about things like Social Security and how to reform it. And politics just seems so different now to the point that Harry Brown's book almost doesn't connect because it's so wonky compared to what we talk about now, which is character and people. And it's, it's, it's almost a, um, the talk radio slash reality TV ization of politics has kind of drifted us from those policy points. Yeah, maybe, um, you know, I, I sometimes joke every president seems worse than the one before it, and it, it kind of doesn't seem possible how we can continue along that uh, along that train of things. I think there's a lot of demand out there for solutions. Um, you know, I don't think Congress's approval rating has ever been lower than it is now. Not, I mean, it, and it's never really been that high, but it seems to be going ever further downwards. And you know, I'm in D.C., so I interact. I'm based in Washington D.C., so I inter interact with a lot of the. Uh, uh, the different players and, and, you know, the people engage in this ecosystem here. And uh, I mean, it's just miserable being a member of Congress. Now you spend all your time fundraising, you have no ability to introduce anything. Um, leadership decides everything. Uh, so you end up with people who want the job for the perks of it, or want the job to climb to something higher. Um, or, you know, people who do it out of some sense of duty, and they get burned out or drummed out or, or, or whatnot. Um, and I just don't think that's sustainable. I agree with you. That's kind of what our political so ecosystem is pushing towards. And somehow the Democratic and Republican primary processes are now designed to produce the worst possible candidates for both of those parties. Uh, and you see a lot of frustration about that by, in people in those parties. Um, so I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, being able to talk about how we would go in a different direction has an open audience. And, you know, I, I, I reread re -read through... Um, uh, why government doesn't work again last year the same and uh, his ability to kind of prophesize what would happen is kind of startling so like on the chapter on health care uh, you know at the time we were debating like prescription drugs and uh, covering children and all of that in the 90s um, but he kind of laid out the the history and the trend of things in the expansion of government involvement in healthcare. And at the time he said, half of every dollar spent on healthcare is controlled by government and that's distorting the market. And kind of here's what will happen next. And then after that, this will happen. And then after that, this will happen. And he didn't put dates to it uh, cause he, you know, he wasn't trying to be Nostradamus or anything, but uh, everything he laid out in that sequence of events has come to pass. And um, well, I mean, there's more things along the sequence of events. And the last one is basically the, you know, the health enforcement agency finds a French fry in your glove compartment and, and finds you or arrests you for uh, imposing excessive costs on the state uh, for the healthcare uh, system. So, uh, you know, at the time, I thought that was ridiculous. They're never going to, you know, launch some war on fatty foods or something. But, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of states have already started doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, including Michael Bloomberg. Um, yeah. So how you're running to be at the top of the food chain. I know Nick Sarwark calls himself the least important libertarian leader, something along those lines. Right. Um, but how does the libertarian party or libertarian movement at large stand out? Like I view the future of the libertarian party as the voice of the small business owner, the voice of the middle class as, you know, Republicans start to chase after 
the working poor and the Democrats start to chase after the uber rich and a weird confluence of events. You know, the people in the middle, the sane people, the people who are just kind of scratching their heads, really 80 percent of this country going, I, I don't know what any of this is. I'm not interested. I'm just looking yeah. for solutions. How do we craft a path forward as as a movement to really start to give normies, regular people solutions? Well, a lot of people now are feeling politically homeless. Um, registrations for independent uh, have never been higher. Um, a lot of people aren't voting, uh, even though they care a lot about the system. Um, and, you know, you just seeing the lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden on the Democratic side and seeing the alarmism from a lot of, you know, a lot of people uh, on the Republican side about um their choice as well. I think there is a big opportunity for us. Um, a lot of it is uh, just kind of usual campaign tactics of figuring out our messaging. Um, so just as an example, I ran for attorney general in DC in 2018. That was to keep our ballot access here, which we were able to do. Um, in coming up with the messaging for the campaign, uh, I wanted to come up with three issues then and uh, things I called 80% issues, stuff 80% of the electorate would agree with, but were not being met by the incumbent in the race or really by any other, anyone else running for office. And uh, in DC, those were, uh, let's get barriers out of the way for the construction of new housing, which the attorney general can do. He's got uh, a deputy attorney general that can intervene in, in those cases where somebody's uh, trying to block construction or prevent anything. I got a bunch of stories on that. Um, <clears throat> let's get uh, obstacles out of the way of, of expanding school choice. And then let's actually hold the metro system here, the leaders of it, accountable for their lack of safety and their disregard for people dying on it and all of that, um, which the, the attorney general here has. He, he's eager to use those powers against every private business, but is totally hands off when it comes to the metro system, which has been literally killing people. Um, and, you know, that, that message resonated with people um, because, and, you know, it's not anti-libertarian. It's not, you know, end the Fed or, or pull the troops out because the D.C. Attorney General really doesn't have anything to do with that kind of stuff. Um, but it still carried libertarian principles forward. And, um, and honestly, a, a, a message that really worked with a lot of people uh, related to all of that was, wouldn't it be nice if we had a libertarian at the table raising these issues and even even died in the wool democrats don't want a hundred percent control of this city um because they're worried about what what would happen in that situation they want other voices at the table and so they were uh they were they were open and willing and, and we got quite a few votes on it we got more votes than donald trump got for president in 2016 um which uh you know, maybe isn't a high bar in the District of Columbia, but it's uh, an important bar that we had to meet uh, beat, and I'm glad we were able to do it. Uh, so what the Libertarian Party can do on all of this is help with this training and help with this framing and helping candidates and affiliates decide the messaging that works for their communities. Because the messaging that works for the Attorney General's race in the District of Columbia isn't going to be the messaging that works for other races in other parts of the country. Uh, but if we can start communicating that Libertarians are about solutions. Libertarians are about principles. Libertarians are about making sure that good policy decisions are made and that, um, you know, we always have freedom and liberty and, uh, and individual choice at the forefront. I think we can make a lot of headway. So one of the big changes in the movement since I've been a part of it in, in 2007, you know, when I, when I joined, there were goes back to sort of that reality TV that Trump is tr like Trump has just kind of in a lot of ways torn the fabric of not just the country, but also the the movement and how libertarians talk to each other, mm -hmm. uh, which there were always disagreements between, you know, you've got the, the Mises versus Cato type nonsense, you know, instead of everybody working together, we got to fight something that happened 40 years ago. Right. Um, but there seems to be a new layer with social media of. I don't know. It's a it's a vocal twenty thirty percent of uh, of online people that just kind of scratch at anybody who wants to poke their head up and talk about something other than what that person wants them to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the 
infighting discussion, which I tend to think is a little overinflated. It, it, it's, it gets us all emotional, but it's not necessarily important, but it does distract us a lot. So like, how do you deal with wanting to be a solutions-based party, but then you've got a very vocal group of people who don't want that to take place. They want to drown out the conversation to move things their way. Like, how, how do you plan to navigate that if you become chair? Because it seems to me to be one of the bigger problems facing us is just the tenor of social media within the movement. Uh, the short answer is to be set a good example and hope that others follow and incentivize people to follow. And I can give some examples on it. So, you know, I've been, I moved to DC in 2004, uh, but worked in the policy space, worked in transportation policy, worked at the DC attorney general's office for a bit, and then uh, uh, in tax policy and helped build organizations, been board chairs and, and so forth uh, since then. And, um, you know, went to law school somewhere in that anyways. But anyways, uh, you know, so I've been, active in the libertarian movement here in DC for quite some time and interacting with a lot of people. And uh, there's a, obviously a, a gap. There's a lot, there's, there's a lot more libertarians than libertarian party members. Um, you know, it's kind of orders of magnitude more. And uh, so I, I've always been kind of the weird one that's, you know, involved in the DC libertarian scene while also being a member of the party. I, 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 um, there's not a lot of us, uh, there, there, at least there weren't used to be a lot. They didn't used to be a lot of us, um, in part because I think the, the libertarian party has a reputation of, uh, kind of not succeeding, uh, of being, you know, the circular firing squad that, that doesn't want to do anything. And, uh, you know, I, I think 2016 belied that. I think 2016, a ticket was nominated to try, try. And to try to get in front of Americans and and try to uh, offer a real choice for uh, for America on on who to vote for for president, and uh, <clears throat> so that's when I started to get additionally involved in the National Party. And uh, in 2018, I decided to run for the National Committee. National Committee consists of 17 members, um, four officers, eight regional reps, and then five at-large members. So I ran for the at-large seat one of the five at large seats. And, uh, and, you know, all sorts of people told me, you know, why are you bothering? It's, you're not getting anything done. It's hopeless. It's, it's just, just don't do it. Um, but you know, I wanted to try and, and honestly, my campaign messaging in running for that race was, you know, I, I want to run to be a voice for, uh, solutions. I want to be a voice for, uh, figuring out problems and solving them um, hiring good staff, making sure they're they're empowered, uh, setting goals, um, testing and trying things, and reinforcing success. And I end up coming up in second in the race uh, out of the five and was elected. So even among libertarian delegates, um, which of course you know is an even smaller subsection of libertarian party members, um, that message has a has a open audience, a willing audience. And so they were, they, they were willing to, to elect me and, uh, you know, we'll find out in the chair's race if, if they're willing to give me a promotion further and, and, and try to carry that forward, uh, into the leadership of the party. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Uh, you know, you never say never and the vote, you know, nothing matters until the final vote on it. But, um, I truly think that there is a large, uh, maybe less active on social media majority, that wants the party to help solve problems and ha and has a shared vision of an America being set free in our lifetime, which means we've got to do a bunch of stuff now. Yeah. So I, I want to ask an uncomfortable question. Um, sure. I, I respect Nick Sarwark and I've known him a long time. And I think that if, uh, I think if, when we look back at his chairmanship, he's been the most successful chair in my time in the party. And I think, for instance, the office is in, in great shape and the party, by and large, is in good shape. But we have I, a congressman. Yeah, when there's the libertarian congressman. I think we're on the verge if Amash gets elected. This is my opinion, not Joe's. If Amash gets selected as the nominee, I think it will be, you know, he announces and he's on the Sunday shows this week. That's not going to stop. It's going to continue. I think it'll be a very successful year. And I'm, I'm sure that he was instrumental in making Amash comfortable with his the decisions that he's made um, in terms of, you know, 
here's 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 the roadmap. Here's the support that you'd have from local and states, and here's the picture, right? Um, my main criticism of Nick is his online behavior. I think picking the fight a couple years ago, I was very vocal about he shouldn't pick fights with people like Tom Woods because I'm I look at it and I go, why pick a fight with people in the libertarian media? There's when I started this show, there were like two other libertarian podcasts. And it was Libertarian Solution, a radio show down in Arizona, and uh, I don't even remember the other and me. And now we there's have a, a, a yeah, there's quite <laughs> a few. There's a blossoming ecosphere of this, and he has he he's fearless, but sometimes it's ill advised to to be snark work, as he's affectionately called. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Um, one before. Yeah. Uh, and he and I have had our back and forth, but I do have respect for him. I think that he is he is well intended, and and the rumors of the CIA and all that stuff is just so overblown. How do you intend to use social media? I mean, I would just say that that is my big drawback: is that he made unnecessary enemies and and relished a little bit in that too much. And and I'm sure that that's going to be a lot of our listeners who are going to be delegates. They're they're going to want to know, like, hey, is this going to be the end of that, or how are you going to handle social media and and move forward with promoting the party? Yeah, no, that's a, certainly a fair question. Um, I am not a pick fights on social media guy, um, and uh, you know, so if if you, if, I've got a personal Facebook page. And then I've got a campaign or a kind of at large member and now a campaign Facebook page. And on both of them, I'm <clears throat> laying out what I see as the facts um, and sometimes photos of my dog and my husband. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, today's May 4th uh, when we're recording this. And so it's the 50th anniversary of the Kent State shooting. So on my personal page, I, I wrote up a little just summary of um, what happened at Kent State for people that might not be familiar with it. And, um, you know, I'm not attacking anybody on it except maybe President Nixon, um, <laughs> and uh, just just sharing, you know, a little bit of history uh, that's part of our legacy and something that we should never really forget. Uh, and then on my personal page or on my camp, um, my campaign and and at large member page, uh, you know, we had a really controversial vote on the national committee on Saturday, so I I posted something of the what the vote was who voted what way. And then as the first comment, um, I posted why I voted the way I did. And I've done that consistently throughout my at large term. So, you know, I can't promise people aren't ever going to, I can't promise everyone's always going to agree with everything that I would do as chair. Um, that's impossible. Um, but, uh, I can promise that I'm going to be as transparent as possible about why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, I'm going to be explain about, explain about it. And if you disagree with me, I'm going to be respectful in, in talking about it. Um, cause I do think we have a respect deficiency, uh, 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 and it's not everybody, but it's a lot of people because I mean, there's a lot of libertarians who get burned out in the libertarian party and it's partly over commitment and it's partly, uh, our welcoming committee is not as welcoming as it could be. And, uh, I'd like to change that. And, you know, I can't, bang a gavel and change it. I can't decree anything and change it. All I can really do is set a good example on it. And that includes social media presence. And, you know, I joined the national committee. There were all sorts of factions on the national committee. And, uh, you know, we were just coming off the term where we had Arvind Vora and, uh, and all that stuff I, that was before me. Um, but, but I joined. And so there was still a bit of a legacy of, of the tension from that. And, uh, and honestly, it took us six months of, of talking past each other. We didn't really have a good um, kind of icebreaker, <laughs> get to know you thing. We just kind of got thrown into it. And everybody, uh, you know, everybody communicates in a different way. Everybody has different priorities or, you know, we may all ha share the same goals, but we have different emphasis within them. And we didn't really, we kind of had to feel that out with each other. Um, since then, I think we've been a much more constructive national committee. You know, we disagree on stuff. We have close votes. We we, we battle on things, but we're able to talk on it and, 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 you know, leave the, the fights at, at the table. Um, and I think that's a lot of the, a, a lot of what's required. And, um, I've tried to be part of that. I've tried to, um, draw out, um, points of compromise, draw out 
um, you know, instead of focusing on motivations or intentions, talking about uh, what our goals are and what outcomes would be, what concerns would be. And uh, so uh, I've at least tried to contribute to that. And I've gotten quite a few endorsements in this race from uh, members of the national committee more than either of my opponents and I, and, and across factions. So, you know, I'm a pragmatist, but I've got a lot of radicals supporting me. I've got a lot of people in other groups supporting me um, in part because I, you know, I think they understand that, that I want to be fair and that I want to build something up, not break it down. Yeah. And, that, and that's one of my, uh, that's one thing I've noticed is that the LNC, the little bit I've paid attention this LNC specifically has been fairly good. I mean, I've seen some battles. I mean, the Wayne Allen Root days, for instance, or the you know just some of the some of those early 2010 days were were brutal. Uh, and and the, this seems to be a, an LNC of people who get along. And it, while there are factions, they feel <laughs> yeah. There's people feel heard and they're, you know, I don't know, like the, the convention being moved and dealing with the pandemic stuff is kind of the first little argument that I've seen pop up. And it doesn't seem to me to be handled in the way, the toxic way that it was in LNC's past. So, you know, to whomever is responsible for that, I'm sure you are part of it. The the chairman's part of it. Thank it's you. A team effort. Yeah. yeah. It's a team effort, you know, and, and just getting along. I think that personal level, like I look back and I think, you know, man, at the time I didn't, I, I, I thought, Lee writes was this way, but as time goes on, you, you learn to go. I really respected Lee writes. I respect him now. Uh, I, I respect George Phillies. You know, some of these yeah. people in at the time when you're in the middle of it, you don't, you don't have as much appreciation for as you should. I mean, uh, I got a story on that, um, which I, which I tell too much now, uh, but uh, I haven't told you yet. So um, I don't know what you're talking about. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, so at our first budget meeting of the term, we were presented a deficit budget, negative six figures. And um, we already, you know, we just come off of a deficit budget the year before. We had no, no money in the bank. We had $100,000 of unpaid bills. Um, we, we just couldn't do a deficit budget. And at the first day of the LNC meeting, we just kind of spun our wheels and didn't really come up with any solutions. And, you know, I'm a, at this time, at the time, I'm a freshman on the national committee. This is my first budget meeting. And so I kept waiting for somebody to, you know, got a lot of reelected incumbents there uh, to step up and say, you know, we can't do this. Here's the solution. And just the first, so by the end of the first day of the two day meeting, we hadn't gotten it. We hadn't made any progress. And uh, I ended up hanging out with Richard Longstreth who's the representative for region one, which is like the Western states. And uh, he's radical. I'm a pragmatist. In votes up until that point, I don't think we had ever voted together on anything. Um, we really have different conceptions of uh, where the party should be going and, and kind of the end state of libertarianism and all of that. Um, and, you know, you name the issue. I don't think we agreed on it, but we both want the budget to be balanced. And, you know, he's an accountant by trade. I'm a lawyer who's got a lot of nonprofit management experience. And, uh, and we were just griping together about it. And, you know, kind of together, we both said, let's, let's come up with an alternative. And, you know, let's, let's just make it a real alternative. Because, you know, I don't want to vote. I, you know, I, I remember saying, I don't want to vote against this without at least trying to put something better together. And so we stayed up very, very late into the night going through every line item in the budget, draining all the slush funds, finding all the hidden stuff, um, haircutting everything, but making sure all the essential stuff kept going. And uh, and then the next morning we were going to present it. I think we honest, I, I honestly thought it would fail two to 15. They'd pass it, but hey, at least we would have tried. Um, it took all day, but it ended up getting adopted. And that's how the LNC balanced its budget. And... Uh, you know, so I, so I think there's, you know, there's, a, there's a hunger for uh, solutions, uh, even in that context. And I mean, Richard and I, we still don't really agree on a lot of stuff, but he's my first phone call on a lot of things. And, um, you know, because, you know, I'm able to talk to my people and Richard's able to talk to his people. And, and, you know, you get the two of us together and, and you're, you're often halfway home on something. Um, 
and you know i've got to give a little and he's got to give a little on on coming up with solutions but they're better for the party and um so you know that that's just one example i could give a lot more but um that's the kind of stuff that's been going on on the lnc this term yeah people tend to think you know back when i was more involved i was part of the cabal and and people right. you know a libertarian elitist i'm like do you have any idea how easy it is to be a libertarian elitist you just show up and if you show up for like two years straight <laughs> you're in the elite club like you're it, it's not it's not a, a big pool which is why i think some of those arguments feel a little more sharp i mean i've got a good professional career i'm not doing this for the power i'm not doing this for the notoriety um i got plenty of that um i'm suing the irs i already i already am in uh, i already have a microscope on me in a lot of ways so uh, yeah, all right well let's talk about that decision uh okay. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know anything about that but that sounds uh what are you doing? What happened? Why are you suing the IRS? Uh, okay. So my day job is I battle state tax policy. So I go all over the country fighting bad tax policy. I built up a team at a nonprofit organization that I worked with, worked at for about 10 years. Um, and by the end of my tenure there, we were knocking down about $2 billion a year in uh, state taxes. So not bad work. And, uh, uh, you know, it carries over into some federal stuff. Um, so the Institute for Justice, which is a libertarian public interest law firm here in, in the D.C. area, uh, they one of their core issues is licensing. So dumb laws that require people to get licenses for stuff that, you know, you, you, sh you don't really need a license for. So the IRS passed this regulation that said if you want to prepare tax returns for money, you have to get a license from the IRS and pay this excessive fee. Um, and you know, there's, it's, it's dumb. Um, I'm a, because I'm a lawyer, I'm actually exempt from the license. So, I mean, anybody who thinks this is about like qualifications or knowledge of the tax law or, I mean, it's nonsense. It isn't, it's not, it's just a, a money-making scheme from the IRS. Well, not just money-making, but we've also seen in the shutdowns why business registration matters. If they don't register your business, then what what else do they have to hold over your head if they want yeah. to enact shutdowns, for instance? It's about yeah. power, too. So IJ got that struck down. Um, that licensing thing was thrown out. Um, so, you know, good job. They did a, they did amazing work. I helped do a, a expert testimony in that case, and it was, it was great that they did that. Um, so the IRS comes back and says, all right, we're not going to license, but we're going to still keep collecting the fee. Um, so if you're a paid tax pre preparer, you still have to register and pay this annual fee. So uh, a libertarian lawyer thought that was dumb. And so he's filed a lawsuit um, against the IRS on it. He got some two accountants and then me. Um, I can give a lot of re I can give a long explanation about why I'm involved, but I'm involved. <laughs> and uh, so the three of us are the class representatives for the class of everyone who's paid this fee to the IRS. So we're suing the IRS over it. Um, we did very well in trial court. The government appealed to the DC circuit. Um, to uh, Merrick Garland, who uh, ruled partly in favor of the IRS and partly in favor of us, um, upheld the fee, but highly suggested it is excessive and sent it back to the trial court to figure out how excessive it is. So that's kind of where we're at in it. But in, at the end of the day, I think it's going to end up being about $160 million refunded uh, that the IRS doesn't want to pay back. Um, so, you know, I often get asked, you know, do you think taxation is theft? It's like, I'm getting, I'm trying to get the money back. So, uh, of course. Oh, you don't want to pay your 160 million. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, we'll treat you like you treat us. You can yeah. you have to pay it or else. Um, well, that's really so I, cool. So I get extra, extra special attention every uh, oh, tax I'm year. sure. Yes. Yeah. You, you, I can't imagine like the, how careful you are. I, I mean, it goes with the job, it goes with the territory. But you know what? You're probably not all. And Joe Hauptman has this great line where he says, "Libertarians fight for a life that's far more interesting than the ones they lead." <laughs> and I'm sure that you're all not that interesting or controversial when it comes to sitting down and filing your taxes. We, uh, I mean, we only have one life. Let's let's have some fun with it. That's right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some books or if somebody's a newer libertarian, what are some books or movies or, yeah, I, I, I you know, I'm one of those people, I'll expand your screen. I was looking at your bookshelf, you know, I see, you know, Team of Rivals, John Adams, yeah. Alex Hamilton, you know, The Rise of the Third Reich, The Last Lion series, all kinds of great books on that back bookshelf there. Yeah. 
Um, I got the, the law stuff on the other other wall over there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, well, I prefer history. So that's it's it's a nice bookshelf that, yeah. that you can see on the video on our YouTube channel. Um, what are some books in your formation? Books, movies, audiobooks, magazines. What are some intellectual influences that you could recommend to people that were very important to you and your development? Sure. Uh, well, we talked about why government doesn't work. That'd still be kind of in my top 10 list. Um, I've got a lot of books on political transitions. It's something that really fascinated me when I was getting my degree in college, um, moving from one form of government to another, um, which was happening quite a lot in the 1980s and 1990s. So when I was in college in the late 90s, there were a lot of new papers and books that had just come out on it. So, you know, Brazil moving from a military dictatorship to democracy and kind of how they did that, or Eastern Europe. Uh, Poland choosing between shock therapy versus gradualism and what were the pros and cons of those approaches. Uh, so that kind of stuff really fascinates me. I think it's relevant because uh, in a way, libertarians are advocating for transitions of one type of system to another type of system. And uh, a lot of the kind of philosophical debates we have in libertarianism is really, you know, how fast, how slow, how do we do that transition? So I, I found it really good of informing stuff. Um, I've got quite a few books on healthcare policy. Um, my mom was a nurse growing up. My dad worked at telecommunications in a hospital for 40 years. So did my uncle. I mean, I'm, I'm like the first in my family to not be in the medical industry. Um, but, you know, I still have a big interest in it. And it's, it's kind of this overarching giant problem that um, nobody really has uh, offered good solutions for. I mean, the Republicans came in in 2016 basically it all teed up for them to pass something on healthcare and they were incapable of doing it because they don't really have any idea what they want to do. Democrats have ideas what they want to do, but it's just, you know, spend a bunch of money and, and make everything worse. Um, so, you know, I, I do read a lot on that. I, I got a lot of legal books. Um, let's see. Uh, let me look around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got some religious stuff. It's, it's a lot of this transition stuff. Uh, I've got basically every biography of President Eisenhower. Um, and it's really fascinating reading those because the treatment of him by historians changed dramatically over the years. Really? Um, shortly after he left office, his perception of him was that uh, he was just this do-nothing president that played golf all the time and, and didn't really do anything. And since his papers have come out and since other biographies have come out, um, it shows how untrue that really was. I mean, he was, I mean, he used to be a general. He was the Supreme Allied Commander. I mean, he, he wasn't sitting around doing nothing. He was very much working every day to make things happen, but he understood how you got things done, which is by working through other people, by creating incentives, by creating the structures for people to succeed. Um, the Eisenhower grid comes from him, which is this management technique where you you sort out what's urgent and important from each other to help you decide what to focus on and what you need to schedule and what you need to delegate and everything. Um, and uh, I mean, frankly, he was teed up with so many opportunities to send in American troops that he passed on. Um, I mean, he did a few times, but uh, in the, for the most part, he passed on it or he did it as this superficial gesture just to say that he did it. And then he pulled the troops out very quickly. So like in Lebanon, he sent in troops in 1958 in Lebanon to basically sit on the beach for a month or two and then he pulled them out but it was a big it was just basically a big gesture but that was in opposition to the military brass which wanted a much more full-scale involvement and you know the same thing happened in vietnam where he resisted pressure to go bail out the french and send in american troops um and he diffused a lot of international crises during his tenure um lessons unfortunately that President Kennedy didn't really learn until it was too late and, you know, causing the Berlin standoff and the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and so forth. Um, um. So, yeah, in Vietnam. And uh, so, you know, it, it's just kind of been fascinating reading kind of how he operated and what he did. Um, you know, politically, I don't know you know how much I agree with President Eisenhower, but uh, in terms of him, he may, he may be at least one of our best presidents in keeping us out of war and managing the job and, and, and keeping everything moving. And, and obviously the farewell speech, which libertarians often yeah. quote that not a lot of, you know, normal people 
<laughs> talk about the the industrial military industrial complex speech. Yeah, I mean, and just think about like what you were, what it would be like hearing that from the first time. And this guy who's, you know, conquered, you know, beat Hitler, and um, is you know the number one general in the country, and he's he chooses his farewell speech to be beware of generals, don't let them lead public policy. Um, and, you know, we mostly dis disregarded his advice. Uh, we still do to this day. Um, so that's why I think it's so, still so timely. And, and you know, it, the day will come where we, we follow his advice on that. Um, I also have a lot of train books and a lot of Dick Tracy comic books. <laughs> got, see, you know, I got C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia, which I basically know by heart. I love that series. Um, and, uh, well, and I've written a few boring books on uh, tax policy in certain states, which uh, are real page turners. <laughs> <laughs> and author as well. Very good. Yeah, it is interesting to study history through the lens of like a single person or and that's why I love biographies, because you do, especially biographies now, they take, you know, the the Chernows, the, you know, the Ambroses, the McCulloughs, they, they try to include social history as much as they do just the biography of the person. So you get a, a better understanding of kind of politics at the time. You know, Robert Caro's my president that I, I've really enjoyed reading about was LBJ and Robert yeah. Caro's series on him, which, you know, what an awful human being. You don't walk away with the same respect for, for him that you do with Eisenhower. If you read those books, but yeah, studying history through the lens of a single person, you know, Taylor branches, MLK biographies and the, and the study of the, the civil rights movement, it just gives you such a better appreciation. And then if you attack it from multiple authors, HL Mencken's one of my favorite people to ever live. And I've read several biographies on him and you just get a different shade of a person based on what that person chooses to cover, which I always find to be fascinating, like what catches the attention of the biographer about that person too. Um, so I have an LBJ story for you, which I know you haven't heard yet. Um, yeah. Alan Boyd, who was LBJ's transportation secretary is still alive. He's really old, but he's still alive. And he just wrote a biography and includes some of stories with LBJ, which as far as I know, have never been talked about before. And one of them is, uh, uh, so, uh, Mrs. Johnson really cared about highway beautification. It was a big priority of hers. And so LBJ called up Alan Boyd and said, I want highway beautification put in the next transportation bill. And Boyd was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll try, sir. But the, you know, the appropriating senators don't give a, don't give a crap about that issue. Um, but you know, I'll give it a shot. And, uh, so president Johnson said, well, why don't you, when you talk to Senator so-and-so, and I don't have the book in front of me, I can give actual names, they're in the book. Be good. Um, when, right. you talk to, when you talk to Senator so-and-so, be sure to mention this. And Boyd doesn't reveal what he was told, but he, you know, it's it's some kind of code phrase or something. Right. Like. So, Boyd, so Boyd goes over to the Senator and says, you know, Mrs. Johnson and President Johnson really want highway beautification in the next bill. And the Senator's like, I, you know, I just don't see that as a priority. It's like, well, the President wanted me to mention blank and he said the color drained from the senator's face and and then he, and he just walked out of the room and then um in boyd's telling he's in the gallery when the senate's debating it uh the bill and the senator comes out and he says i need to amend the bill to add language on highway beautification and and you know does anyone object and no one objected and he and he put it in and he said the senator looked up at boyd in the gallery with pure hatred on <laughs> and he said the senator never talked to him again for the rest of his life i don't buy to blame him and then the next scene is is the signing ceremony for the for the highway beautification bill um so that's how we got highway beautification um it's just another lbj story there yeah really a truly terrible human being um not just in the policies uh you know vietnam and 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 the expansion of government but also just uh just an awful human being to everyone around them including his own family and and it's just a great study in just following orders i mean that's you watch one child nation on i think it's amazon prime and or you read about the development of nazi germany or you read about lbj and his cabinet it's like people people absolve themselves of participating in that i mean that's a very small little evil 
You know, like that's just, you know, that, that guy wasn't killing anybody, but there's a reason that that man now hates him. And yeah. Boyd, Boyd is absolved himself of, of it just because he, you know, LBJ told him what to do. And, and it's, it's fascinating what people will, will just kind of walk away from. Yeah. Um, well, let's, uh, let me give you, you know, a few minutes just to pitch yourself and, and shameless self promotion time. So <laughs> you know, if, if people are going to the convention, if they're one of the 1000 and some delegates that are going to participate at this point online or in person, who knows um, right. why, why should, let me phrase it this way. Okay. I've been very critical of the libertarian party. I work, I worked for the party for the libertarian party of Indiana for four years, full time. I devoted a lot of time and money and effort to it. Um, and over the last two to three years, I've become fairly disillusioned with the party, the the just the emotional strength that it's that it takes to stay in the party. Sometimes, yeah. combined with the returns that I see, you know, as I go around and talk to local establishment figures, most of them kind of don't have an awareness of who I am. You know, they don't have an awareness of what the party does or how it operates. You know, why should why should I come back to the Libertarian Party or why should somebody be involved in the Libertarian Party? And why are you the best guy to make that happen? All right. I love that question. Um, the <clears throat> there's a lot of organizations in the Libertarian movement and a lot of people and a lot of entities doing a lot of great work. And I've worked with a lot of them, um, you know, educational organizations, student outreach organizations. Uh, professional organizations, uh, on the ground activist organizations. There's only one organization focused on electing libertarians to public office, and that's the Libertarian Party. So it's kind of incomplete if you're a libertarian supportive of all of those efforts, but not the one that gets the libertarian at the legislative negotiating table. And, you know, I don't begrudge anybody for not being involved to date. Most libertarians aren't involved in the Libertarian Party to date because we haven't proven concept of success. Uh, we're 49 years old, but seemingly still in startup mode. And and we gotta change that. So let me talk about some of the things that I wanna see, and some of which we're already working on to change that. Um, one of them is Libertarian Frontier Project. Out in the Mountain West, uh, one of our contractors did a lot of deep research, kinda on his own time, to figure out districts where We've got a fat and happy incumbent who, uh, you know, from, from usually a Republican, um, who, you know, is disconnected from their district. It's a small population district and uh, wouldn't require a lot of media, wouldn't require a lot of money to kind of dominate uh, and run a competitive campaign. So we identified a bunch of those districts. We found good libertarians who are active in their communities, uh, you know, successful, know a lot of people, and we're running them for those legislative seats. And so the, the precise number changes uh, every, every bit, but, you know, we've got uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 of them that we're running. Um, and these these will be competitive races. So each of these candidates is responsible for their own campaign operation and raising the money for it. The National Party is putting in infrastructure help, phone banking help from all over the country, door knocking help from all over the country, messaging, strategic help, training, um, so in this year's budget, uh, we worked to find a hundred thousand dollars to get into the budget for it. And then I hit the phones with some other people and found another hundred thousand dollars to supplement it. And then plus what the money is on the ground. So this is not a shoestring effort. Um, maybe by, you know, national campaign standards, it's a shoestring effort, but as far as focusing efforts on a couple of, uh, winnable races, it's, it's really important. Um, I don't know how successful we're going to be with it. I think we're going to elect some people in November. And even of the ones we don't elect, we're going to get a lot of valuable lessons that we can apply next time. So for instance, last time in 2018, we almost elected Bethany Baldus as a state representative in Wyoming. And she was kind of a proto uh, type of this uh, new approach of a lot more uh, on the ground, using data, door knocking, messaging focused effort. And uh, she actually won on election day, but she lost with absentees. And what we realized too late is that uh, half of Wyoming leaves Wyoming at the end of summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you start door knocking after that, you miss those voters. So we're fixing that this time. 
And, you know, we're having to recreate things on the fly right now because of coronavirus, but uh, we've learned that lesson and we're applying the lessons from it. So, you know, we're going to elect some people. We've got a congressman now. Um, I, I hope, you know, whoever our presidential nominee is does well. I have to stay neutral on it until we pick him because I got to work with whoever the nominee is. Um, but I think we're on an upswing right now and we're going to be able to shed this, you know, ineffective loser image that I think we've unfairly earned in the Libertarian Party. And I hope when we're able to do that, success breeds success. And, you know, people want to invest in something that's winning. People want to invest in something that's succeeding. And, uh, you know, you, you don't really need to go much further than Jeff Hewitt, who's uh, a libertarian supervisor on a county board in California, one of five. And so it's, it's three Republicans, one Democrat, and Jeff. Right. And he gets along well with the Democrat. You know, libertarians are really good at at building bridges with the other parties. We understand the left in a way the right never will. And we understand the uh, right in a way the left never will. So we, we're kind of natural uh, coalition builders. And when Jeff can get on board with the, the Democrat, they just need one more. And whatever they do is law. And uh, we can have that kind of dynamic all over the place if we play our cards right. You know, it's going to be a long time before I think we can uh, elect a majority of the Senate or a majority of Congress or, you know, well, I'm, I mean, I never say never in politics. I feel like I've lived a lifetime in politics in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we're, we're on the verge of being able to change a lot of things. And, you know, anybody who finds this appealing, anybody who wants libertarians at the policymaking table, anybody who wants to celebrate libertarian victories on election night, um, I mean, we need you now. Because, um, uh, you know, we need reinforcements of people who share that vision and who want to make it happen. And I, I think we're making a lot of progress on it. And, you know, we'll see how the, uh, how the rest of 2020 goes. But uh, that's what I'm committed to. That's why I'm in, involved. I don't have any free time. Uh, this is a nights and weekends thing for me, really. Uh, I've got a, a very time-consuming and stressful job, but I'm able to, to make all of this work because it's important for me. I don't want, uh, you know, whenever my life ends for the country to be in the same situation than it is now or worse. Uh, and if it is, it's not going to, I don't want it to be for lack of trying. How stressful does somebody's job have to be for LP chair to be a vacation? <laughs> um, I, I do. I'm a, I'm a lawyer's lawyer. So oh God. I'm, who lo I'm who lawyers call when they have a crisis that they cannot figure out. So every time my phone rings, it's crisis management. Yeah, I think the, you know, it was so frustrating 10 years ago as Campaign for Liberty was in full swing and the Ron Paul campaigns were kind of, you know, transitioning. And the Amash experiment of we're going to change it from the inside, really, it kind of shows that's just not how it's going to work. He was elected as a Republican, but it's hard to change it from the inside because you never know what factors are going to come along. And the seduction, I think he's going to have a problem answering for some of the, you know, the... Massey, Amash, and Rand, which is why it's so funny to hear Amash is principled because those guys were kind of the heirs to the Ron Paul movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see in their three cases the the compromises that had to be made. And that's part of being in politics is just if you're going to be in politics, yeah. you're going to make compromises because just like you were talking about earlier, you've got to have, you know, I've got to call long stress and we've got to negotiate these things. You know, it's just how it is. But it, it really does seem with having a libertarian congressman and having Amash come over and having, you know, just the candidates that we're going to run against. It does seem like the Libertarian Party is heading in a positive direction. So I wish you all the best. Oh, and I want to earn back your membership and all of your listeners too, not by just, you know, coming on and begging you but by making a party that you will be proud to be a member of. Can I borrow $25? No, <laughs> um, and uh, in full disclosure, and thank you to Ethan Bishop Henchman, who is a patron of We Are Libertarians. So thank you. I, I would I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the great Ethan. Yeah. It's my uh, husband, if anybody's yeah. confused. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, again, it is winwithjoe.org if you want to learn more about uh, all the stuff that Joe is up to. Joe, thank you so much for your time. Anytime, Chris. Thank you to everybody listening to We Are Libertarians, and we will talk to you again next time.
All right.